All right. Good morning, everyone. Let's take out our Bibles today and turn to the Old Testament book of Micah. Uh, Micah chapter 6 is where we're at today. And if you're new to the church, this is our custom. We choose books of the Bible and move through them uh, verse by verse. And today we're in our fifth study in Micah, looking at Micah chapter 6. As you guys are getting yourselves settled there, I'll let you know that um, next week will be our last teaching in Micah, and then after that, we're going to start the book of James together. We're going to do a very fast-paced study through the book of James. I want you to see kind of a New Testament version of Micah, some of the similar uh, exhortations that Micah gave the ancient people of Israel, James gave to the church in the New Testament era, and so we're going to take a look at uh, his short little five-chapter book uh, together. Also, I wanted to uh, mention to you guys today, you know, I, as I pray for the uh, teaching this morning, I want to take a moment to pray for um, the peace in the Middle East. If you haven't been checking the news the last uh, couple of days, Iran uh, attacked Israel this last uh, weekend, and uh, the reportedly uh, Israel, uh, along with American help, was able to shut down that attack. But of course, tension is just in that region and everybody's awaiting, you know, what is the response going to be and all of that. And uh, everybody seems to want to know from me, is this some fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy uh, in some way? Even this morning, I was just out on my morning prayer walk and there's uh, an, a homeless gentleman who we have uh, gotten to know each other a little bit over the years, and uh, he knows I'm a pastor, and he's like, hey, Iran, is that in the Bible somewhere? You know, he wanted to know. So I thought, well, if this guy wants to know, then probably you guys want to know a little bit as well. And uh, what I wanted to share with you is uh, when it comes to the answer of, is this fulfilling some biblical prophecy? Because there are some scriptures in the Old Testament that allude to a day coming when Persia or modern day Iran will uh, invade Israel and stuff like that. When it comes to the question, is this uh, fulfilling biblical prophecy? My answer to you is, uh, I don't know. Um, and also probably not yet. And uh, if I could say it this way, I'm not meaning to be cavalier. I kind of don't care. And uh, here's why. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 24. See that you are not alarmed when you hear of wars and rumors of wars. For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. And then he went on to warn his disciples about the coming age, what that would look like, the tumult uh, that the first generation of Christians and subsequent generations of Christians would experience and endure here on earth. And then he said to us, so here's how I want you to apply these things. And he gave us two stories to help us remember what we should be like. In the first story, he talked about a groom that was going to come in ancient Near East culture. The way that they would do weddings is that the groom would show up in a, at a surprise moment. And uh, the friends of the bridegroom, some of them uh, were waiting well, and some of them were waiting poorly. And uh, Jesus told us, he said, so take this story and watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So he, he tells us we want to be an alert people, but we don't know when all this is going to shake out, when, when Jesus will return, but we want to be alert. We want to live as if we are ready for his return. We want to live as if there's nothing that we're leaving on the table if Jesus Christ was to come back for us today. So we don't want things that we should have done to be undone. And then the second story Jesus told was of a master who went away on a distant journey and entrusted an amount of money to three different servants. Two of those servants invested, did the job that the master wanted them to do, and they built up the master's income. And a third took the money given to him and buried it in the ground so that there was no return on the master's investment. And it seems that the message that Jesus is trying to communicate there is, hey, I'm going to leave and I'm going to give the church a job to do. Focus on the job. And uh, so I just wanted to say that at the outset of this teaching. I, I think we have a job to do. We're going to think about that in our text today. We have a job to do, a mission to accomplish. All that said, it is frightening when you read about stuff like this in the news. Some of you know people that are perhaps even going to be in harm's way as a result of a conflict like this. And so we want to pray and ask for peace uh, on earth. We know one day King Jesus will come and there will be peace on earth, but we want to pray for it 
in this region uh, right now today. So would you guys join me in prayer for our time in the word, but also for this. Lord, we come before you today, and uh, we live in an unsettled world. People doing things out of line with you and your word and results and counter results and all of that. And Lord, we bring it to you, this chaotic, dangerous mess, and we plead with you, Lord, have mercy. We pray, Lord, for peace. We pray, God, that as people who are part of your church here today, if we've believed in you, in Jesus, in the gospel, help us to be a people who are on our mission, or the mission that you have given to us, not to predict dates, not to prognosticate, not even to become overwhelmed with these things, but to be people who are making disciples of all nations, taking the hope of Jesus to a broken and lost world. So we pray, Lord, for your help in that. And Lord, now as we turn to your word, we pray that you'd speak to us, teach us, Lord, from Micah chapter 6, by the power of your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right, I'm going to read the whole chapter if you guys would follow along. Micah chapter 6, verse 1. Hear what the Lord says. Remember I told you guys that the book of Micah is arranged in three main prophecies. Chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 1. And here, chapter 6, verse 1, you get the word hear. Uh, It's an invitation to hear the oracle that's going to come. So this is the beginning of the third oracle. Hear what the Lord says, arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has an indictment against his people and he will contend with Israel. And he says in verse three, oh, my people, what have I done to you? How, how have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened from, and I really feel like I'm not allowed to say this word in church, (laughs) what happened from Shittim, and I... I promise you, I looked that up to make sure I was pronouncing it correctly, and I'm sorry, maybe in church I should say from Crapham to uh, Gilgal. <laughs> sorry, there's a, there's a junior higher in here somewhere. <clears throat> that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Verse 6, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Verse 9, the voice of the Lord cries to the city, and it is sound wisdom to fear your name. Hear the rod of him who appointed it. Can I forget any longer the treasures of wickedness and the house of the wicked and the scant measure that is accursed? Shall I acquit the man with wicked scales and with a bag of deceitful weights? Your rich men are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Therefore, I strike you with a grievous blow, making you desolate because of your sins. You shall eat, but not be satisfied, and there shall be hunger within you. You shall put away, but not preserve, and what you preserve I will give to the sword. You shall sow, but not reap. You shall tread olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. You shall tread grapes, but not drink wine. For for you, verse 16, have kept the statutes of Omri, And all the works of the house of Ahab, and you have walked in their counsels, that I may make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing, so you shall bear the scorn of my people. Okay, this entire passage that we just read, uh, it's framed as a court case that God uh, institutes or initiates between himself and his people. He, he's indicting his people. 
and uh, he calls forth some witnesses or even a jury, and the witnesses he calls are the mountains and the hills and creation itself. It's kind of like God is saying, hey, has it, can anybody back me up here? You know, and for centuries now, the land saw the people of Israel neglect what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, just to remind you of where we're at in the Bible, these people that Micah is speaking to, they lived about 700 years after the Exodus, and they lived about 700 years before the new Exodus, before Jesus came. And after the Exodus, God gave an invitation to the people of Israel to be his partners. I want you to join with me. I want you to be my kingdom of priests here on earth. You're going to make an impact. You're going to show the world who I am. And they had been for many years now, by the time Micah shows up, failing in that mission. And so Micah comes onto the scene and he begins to speak to them because of that failure. You know, instead of behaving as that kingdom of priests representing God to the world around them, they were devoting themselves to the false gods of the world around them. Uh, Instead of joining in on God's mission on earth, they were actually getting in the way of, they were frustrating God's mission on earth. And instead of being the one nation in all of human history that had God as its king, the one theocracy ever, uh, instead they followed wicked kings who gave terrible counsel. That's what this text shows us. And because they'd been guilty for so long and showed no remorse for so long, God was finally ready to sentence them to the judgment of discipline. Uh, The word maybe that carries the deepest meaning in this whole chapter would be found in verse 16. Uh, When it comes to the discipline, it says that they would become a desolation. That means that everything else that God had tried failed, and now they need to be put into exile, and the land needs to be vacated. It needs to become desolate. Now, I want to say that that there were a lot of people groups and a lot of nations on earth at the time that Micah said these things that were doing the same things that Israel was doing, but Micah was not rebuking them. Uh, God was not confronting them, at least not with Micah. The discipline spoken of in this passage happened for God's people because God didn't like what he saw, not in the world in general, but among his people. Uh, Their guilt was a breach of covenant, an impediment to his mission, and a misrepresentation of his character. And uh, so God was bound to do something about it. You say, why was he bound to do something about it? Well, first of all, there's his nature. But secondly, they had made a a contract or an agreement at the end of the book of Deuteronomy where the people of Israel have said, yes, we will live the way you've asked us to live. And if we don't for so long, here's the things that will happen to us. And kind of one of the last things on the list was exile. So it had gotten to that point. Now, when Micah arrived... It's like he had that book of Deuteronomy in his mind and in his pocket. It was a book that Israel had agreed to follow God in. Uh, If they did, they'd prosper. If they didn't, he'd discipline them. And so now it was time for the discipline to come. And the way that Micah said it would happen is the Assyrians are going to come first. If that doesn't work, then the Babylonians are going to come. And they're going to take you into captivity. Okay, but but what I want to point out today is that for for all the doom that's found here, there's an underlying assumption that I want us to spend our time on today. All the greed, all the injustice, all the wickedness that Micah saw in Israel, it was at odds with Israel's truest identity. God is saying these things to them because he saw them completely differently than the way that they were behaving. God's looking at them and he's saying, you're not being who you are. I've made you something completely different. And I I think that that inconsistent behavior for so long, living out of step with their identity, is what God is trying to address right here. He's trying to pull them out of the false identity ditch so that they could walk with him again. So I think every word out of Yahweh's mouth in this chapter is an invitation for us today, if we're believers in Jesus, to live according to, up to, in alignment with our identity in Christ. Uh, Micah has told us throughout this book that there's a shepherd king who has a will for our lives. And today, I think there are so many things that the shepherd king wants to say to us about our identity in him, inviting us to be who we are in him. So 
Let's look at three things following the three movements of the passage. The first movement is verse 1 through 5. And in the first movement of this oracle, it, it seems to me that God reminds us that we are, if we're believers today, God reminds us that we are his special people. And I, I'm not trying to be overly sentimental when I say that, so let me explain what I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, in verse 2, Micah said that God's indictment was against his own people. And in God's opening salvo, when he begins to speak in verse 3 and then in verse 5, he cries out about them. He says, oh, my people. And then after all the goodness that God had shown them over the years, it, it appears in the opening passage that God is like disoriented by Israel's behavior because he asks in verse three, he says, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? It's like God is thinking about his track record with Israel. He's like, I know I've been good to you. I know I've been a blessing to you. I know I've been faithful to you. I know I've been working in your life. Why are you behaving the way that you're behaving? God is acting here like a betrayed husband, crying out to his unfaithful bride, and he reminds his people how special they are to him. Uh, and the way that he reminds them is by recounting to them all that he'd done to make them his own. I mean, he just kind of goes through the list. Uh, chapter 6, verse 4, he says, you know, there was a time 700 years ago I delivered you from your slavery in Egypt. After I brought you out into the wilderness, I then gave you the trio, the siblings. I gave you Moses as your leader. I gave you Aaron, his brother as your high priest. I gave you Miriam, their sister as like the worship leader for Israel. And then as you're wandering in the wilderness, there were people that tried to attack you such as the king of Moab, who tried to hire a sorcerer named Balaam to curse you, but I made sure that the answer of Balaam's mouth was full of blessing over you. It's a classic story there in the book of Numbers. This wicked king Balak tries to hire this sorcerer named Balaam to curse Israel, and three times he tries, but out of his mouth comes this blessing. And King Balak is like, what is going on? I'm paying you to curse them. And he says, I, look, the only thing coming out of my mouth is blessing, blessing for these people of God. And that favor from God, it lasted all the way from the city which shall not be named, uh, which was their last stop while they wandered in the wilderness, to Gilgal, which was their first stop in the promised land. It, it means God is saying, I was faithful to you all the way that whole time to get you to my desired destination. All these stories should have reminded them we are God's special people. And I think our shepherd king wants to remind us of the same thing. We are, if we're in Christ Jesus, his special people. You know, like ancient Israel, the church has been marvelously rescued from slavery. Like ancient Israel, the church has been specially blessed despite attempts to the contrary. You ever read the book of Acts? You see all this animosity and hardship and persecution come up against the church, and what happens? They just flower. They bloom. They blossom. They expand. The curse turned into a blessing. And like ancient Israel, the church has been miraculously protected on its journey. I mean, if you like really think about the behavior of the church over the last 2,000 years, it's like, it's a miracle. We're still here. Like that to me is one of the biggest signs of God's grace that despite all our folly and bad doctrine and horrible decisions and all of that, we're still around. I mean, that's just the grace of God. But when we neglect our identity, who we are, in place of lies, we falter just like Israel did. I once heard the story of a notoriously cantankerous church gardener and uh, before I tell this story, I just want to say it's not about anybody at this church. It didn't happen here. So if you're like, I know who he's talking about. You don't know who I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, what, what I heard is that this guy grew to dislike it when people visited the church property uh, because his feeling was, you guys are going to ruin my work. <laughs> like, I don't want anybody to be here. I created this pristine environment. I don't want anybody here to be here. It got so bad that during the week, people in this particular church started avoiding the church grounds. 
because they're like, he just has like a comment always or a look or whatever. It just, he was an unpleasant man uh, because it is possible to believe in Jesus yet still be unpleasant. And uh, <laughs> that's who he was. And uh, one day he uh, was in a class at his church, <clears throat> smaller group, and uh, he announced to the group, uh, he said, I'm, I'm just simply a cranky old man, and I've been cranky my whole life, just the way I am. Uh, but the teacher pushed back in that moment and said, I thought you said you were a Christian. Being cranky is what you do when you forget who you are. And apparently that little word just messed with him so much and he started searching out the truth of the New Testament and he realized, oh man, I've been wrong to take on this false identity when I have a new identity in Christ. And he began to grow and change and uh, pretty soon people liked going to the church after that. So let's think about for a second before we move on to the second big point, let's think for a second about how we can retrain our minds and our souls to live from that new identity in Christ because I think there's two major ways that are suggested in uh, the first five verses of Micah 6. Uh, the first way is uh, that while God was reminding them of their true identity, uh, he reminded them of his past intervention in their lives, right? He just goes through the list. I delivered you from Egypt. I covered you when you were attacked. I brought you all the way to Gilgal. I was faithful to you. I want you to remember those stories, and all those stories would have been evidence, it would have reminded them of their position as Yahweh's special people. And what I want to say is, I think that this helps us see that it's important for us today to develop our God stories of his faithfulness in our lives and have them stuck in our memory and repeated often. We've got to preach them to ourselves so that we might remember how special we are uh, in his sight. This begins, of course, with the story of the cross. This is one thing that was so great about Easter week, to just meditate upon the cross of Christ again. That is the singular story that we need to recall and remember over and over and over again. It's part of why taking communion each week has been such a blessing for us as a church. But core God memories would also include your story of how he reached you. How did he do that? When did it happen? You know, what things did he do? Who did he bring into your life? What circumstances did he allow? Uh, moments that he guided you? You know, have you ever had something as you've looked back on your life, you realize, you know, when I was going through that, I was really upset with the direction things were taking. I felt kind of trapped and disappointed. But now looking back, it was the best decision, the best direction that could have happened in my life at that time. I just didn't know it. Uh, or stories of his faithfulness as you look back on your life, ways he's spoken to you over the years. When you meditate on these memories, it helps you recall who you are in him. So I'd encourage you to do that. Collect these stories and have them uh, be part of your consciousness. But, but, but God also, in this little passage, verse 1 through 5, he reminded his people of their identity by reminding them about Moses and Aaron and Miriam. And I think when he's doing that, what he's, what he's saying to them is, who are your people? You, you are the people that come from someone like Moses. And in his right mind and in his holy state, Aaron. And in her worship and devotion and celebration of God, Miriam, those are the kind of people that you come from. And I think for us as Christians, there are like thousands of moments in our lives where we have to ask ourselves the question, who are my people? This is one reason why being in Christian community is of utmost and vital importance. You know, we think we grow out of the like peer pressure thing and stuff like that once we leave school and then we're like, we're, I'm my own man, I'll do whatever I want to do. But the reality is you will so often default to your people. And so asking yourself, who are my people? And I think... What God is saying to the people of Israel here when he talks to them about people who have been dead for 700 years in Moses and Aaron and Miriam, I think the Lord is saying to us, your people, church, are the saints of old. You are to have boldness like Moses, be consecrated to God like Aaron, worship like Miriam, be loyal to God like 
Abraham, be devoted like David, steady like Isaiah, prayerful like the psalmist, hopeful like the prophets, take steps of faith like Peter, mind the depths of God like Paul, be on a mission like the early church, and love like the apostle John. Those are our people. And uh, God, I think, tries to get us back to our truest identity by asking that question, who are your people? All right, so th- that's the first thing. We are, we are God's, uh, we, are, we are special to God. Okay, the, the second movement of the oracle, verse six through eight, this is the most famous section in the book of Micah. Might be the only section that some of you knew when we opened up the, the book because it's, it's got that level of um, fame attached to it. But I think in the second movement of the oracle, God reminds us that we are his covenant partners. That might not have been a way that you described yourself this week. Who are you? Well, I'm a covenant partner with God. So let me explain that to you uh, today. Uh, once Micah, or excuse me, once Yahweh finished his accusation, or at least just put it on pause, Micah in verse 6, he's the one who starts talking, and he asks this question. He says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? In other words, Micah is asking the question, what does God really want? What does God really want? And then Micah went on to wonder. Uh, He he basically wonders, does God want this long list of sacrifices? And he kind of like increases them in intensity as he wonders this out loud. He starts with, does God want burnt offerings? And then he ups it a little bit. Does God want thousands of rams? And then he ups it a little bit, and he gets all like, man, only a king could do this. He's like, does God want 10,000 rivers of oil sacrifice? Uh, And then he gets most intense when he says, does God want me to imitate the pagan nations around me and sacrifice my own child? Is that what God wants? What does God want in order for me to be cleansed from the sin of my soul, he says in verse 7. Then Micah gave a general exhortation. He said in verse 8, here's the famous verse, God has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Now, when Micah said this, I want to be careful to say he was not dogging the sacrificial system that God had authored and installed in ancient Israel. He's not like, oh, you know, those sacrifices are so stupid. That's not ever what God desires. It's not what Micah is saying. God gave them the sacrifices to help them find relief for their failure when they failed to execute the mission that God had given to them. Uh, But what he truly wanted for them was to do justice, love kindness, and humbly walk with God. The the sacrifices were meant to help them stay on track for their mission, but they weren't the mission. God had invited them into a covenant with himself, and now they were partners in reaching the world. And they were to have that mentality about themselves. What are we here on earth? We are God's covenant partners. We have a purpose Uh, The people in Micah's day and the church today should say, we have a purpose here on earth. We are partnering with God in his work. Uh, There's that book, and uh, they made a movie about the book, uh, American Sniper by Chris Kyle. I really liked uh, both. Uh, But in the book, he tells this uh, story about a formative moment in his early life. Uh, As he tells the story, he said he was just a boy, and his dad explained to him <clears throat> that there are three types of people in the world. There, there might be more than that. Uh, his dad wasn't an author of scripture or anything, but he saw it this way. There are three types of people in the world. There are sheep, he said. There are wolves, he said. And there are sheep dogs who protect the sheep from the wolves. And uh, his encouragement to his son was, I want you to be a sheep dog. I want you to be someone who takes care of and thinks about others, which uh, he said was a major reason that he wanted to serve as a sniper who watched over troops in combat. So to borrow that terminology, I think that every Christian, every believer, not just a certain group of us, but every believer is called to, in our truest identity, a sheepdog life. Like ancient Israel, we are God's covenant partners to reach our world. And Yahweh's answer to Micah's question 
about what does God want is incredibly helpful because the Torah was filled with hundreds of laws. What does God really want at the end of the day? Micah boils them all down to three statements. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. It's very similar to when they came to Jesus and said, what's the, what's the greatest law? What's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You find both of those right here in Micah 6, verse 8. God wanted all his people to practice love for their neighbor and literally build fabricate, do justice. Not feel it, do it, he says. And he wanted them to love kindness, which means be a person of loyalty and faithfulness who helps people, particularly people in their need, by providing practical help. And all of this was to be done from the foundation of a humble walk with God, meaning they were to be in constant contact with God, walking but also in agreement with God. What's the pace? What's the destination? Where are we going? In other words, they, they were to have their daily devotional life, walk with God, but also do good things for people uh, in need. Okay, now let's talk about this for a second because I realize in our modern world and even in the church, uh, justice has become a complicated and hotly debated uh, concept. I Don't cancel Micah, uh, you know, oh, man, he's just too woke or something. Uh, if Micah's got something to say to us, the question we want to ask is, what does justice look like today? And uh, since this exhortation was given to ancient Israelites living in the only theocracy to ever exist, how do we take Micah 6 eight and apply it in our modern society or in the church? Uh, I know there's a lot of nuance to this. I know there's all kinds of political theory behind exhortations for justice. But all I want to say here is that I think that God's people should not overly complicate the issue. Uh, we are to, according to the Old and New Testament, care for those in need. We're to love widows. We're to love the fatherless. We're to love the parentless. We're to love the impoverished. We're to love the imprisoned. We're to love the addicted. We're to love the marginalized. We're to love the forgotten. We're to love the downtrodden, the oppressed, the taken for granted, the disabled, the sick, the mentally ill, and the hurting people of this world. That's what we're supposed to do. I mean, you can, if you're like, I don't know that the Bible teaches that. Well, in my footnotes of my notes, I just listed like 50 cross-references, so have at it. You know, just have fun. Go read the Old and New Testament, and uh, you'll see that we're called to this. And when we do these things, we're behaving just a little bit like Jesus. Uh, these acts do not save us. It's hilarious to me how quickly someone can hear words like do good things to people uh, who are in need and say, man, don't preach the law at me. I'm not saved by my works. No one's saying that. No one's saying that at all. This is not us being saved by our works. They're not the sum total of our walk with God either. The, the liberal church has done this. We don't even need the gospel. We're just going to be great, nice people. No, it's not the, it's, it, we need the gospel. We need the cross. But they're just natural ways to express our salvation and walk with God. There are ways Christ-likeness can evidence itself in our lives. Even Paul's simple exhortation in Galatians, just one line, is enough to fill our lifetime when he says that the early apostles asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. All right, now this concept, I want to say this. This concept from Micah, I think it explains a lot of the frustration that people sometimes experience in their relationship with God. Because what Micah is revealing here is that God has goals. Here, what he wants is he wants his people to be instruments of his love to this world. God has goals. But the thing is, is that we also have goals. And when there's a misalignment between or conflict with God's goals and our goals for our lives, our walks with God can become very frustrating. And to be honest with you, I think sometimes the, the same question that Micah was wrestling with, what does God want, this is the thing that stumbles uh, even a lot of modern Christians. We have our goals, we have the things that I want, there's stuff I want to have happen in my uh, career or my family or my health or whatever. I've got these desires, these goals, and uh, 
maybe the way that I can get them is by doing some of the sacrifice things in like a New testament kind of way. So if I go to church enough, or I'm serving enough in my church, or I'm giving enough, or I'm reading the Bible enough, I do these things, I offer God these sacrifices, then he will help me reach my goals. Um, But what Micah is showing us is that sometimes God's goals and our goals do not overlap entirely. And when that happens, we become frustrated. God is trying to work Christ-like Christ likeness in us. He is trying to put us on this mission uh, here on earth. And uh, we become frustrated because we're not getting from God what we expected to get. But listen, uh, that's like a walking into an in and out hamburger joint, walking up to the counter, <clears throat> and instead of ordering, like I order, I'll give you guys my order real quick, a three by three. I like the three patties, the three cheeses. It's a heart attack in a bun. Animal style, hold the tomato extra pickles with, if I'm feeling really good about myself, animal style fries too. Instead of going up and ordering that, saying, I want a Big Mac, you're in the wrong place. You're going to the wrong source for the thing that you want. And when we try to use God to fulfill our dreams and our desires, we often miss what he's really trying to do through us. What does he want? For us to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with him. Now, the beautiful thing is that a lot of times when we live that life, some of the things that we want, there is an overlap. There's a beautiful life that we get to live, and so many of the things that we're kind of hoping for, it's like a backdoor way for those things to come into our lives. Uh, But we've got to, you know, want what the Lord wants. Jonah uh, is a good example of what I'm trying to talk about, that frustration. Uh, God's goal for Jonah was to preach to the people of Nineveh. Uh, Jonah's goal for God was for God to judge the people of Nineveh. Uh, So this made Jonah very unhappy, really unhappy for a few days, especially. He had dreams, he had desires that conflicted with God's dreams and desires. And uh, Like, surprise, surprise, God wasn't going to change his desires. So Jonah had to be brought into conformity with God's plan. Because what what, what Jonah wanted God to do was in conflict with God's very nature. So I say all this because Micah's words, I think, should massage our perspective on what God is trying to produce in us. He's trying to generate Christ-likeness in us. Uh, when, when you see the phrase, love God, love others, sometimes we say that, like, ah, that's what all Christianity is. It just kind of boils down to that, and we say it, like, real quickly. It, that is not a trite saying. When you say, love God, love others, I, what I want you to think about is the ultimate time that happened. Jesus died on the cross. He was loving his father, submitting completely to his father, and he was paying the price for the sin of the world. It was a brutal thing that he did in order to love God and love others. It wasn't just a quick feeling, it was sacrifice. And it's this Lord that we follow, this brand of sacrificial life that Micah mentions to us. So we are, secondly, God's covenant partners. Okay, let's wrap it up today by looking at verse 9 through 16 and thinking about the last and third movement of the oracle. God reminds us that we are uh, his image bearers as well. Uh, If the question of the first movement is, who are your people? And the question of the second movement is, what does God want? The question of this third movement, verse 9 to 16, is, which king do you reflect? Which king do you reflect? And uh, what, what I mean is that the third section of this oracle, it's a long rebuke of the injustices that God saw in Israel, followed by the statement You can look at verse 16 with me, that they had kept the statutes of Omri and done all the works of the house of Ahab. Uh, What that means is that the people of Israel, the people of God, who should have been, we just learned in verse 8, walked humbly with God. Instead, they were walking in the the counsel of two of the most wicked kings in all of Israel, Israel, Israelite history. 
They were reflecting Omri and Ahab more than they were reflecting Yahweh and the shepherd king that Micah prophesied about. Now, in the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, we're told that humans were created to bear God's image on earth. It's actually a beautiful statement filled with lots of purpose for us. Because at the time that the book of Genesis was written, uh, ancient kings from that era, when they were, uh, had won victories over distant lands, what they would do, because they couldn't travel there very easily, is they would install statues that looked like themselves in those foreign lands, images that were to remind the distant lands populace there's a king far away and we're under his rule and reign. What Genesis tells us is that humans on earth, that's what we are for God. God made this little rock that's spinning around the sun. He put us on it and he said, I might be far, but you are my images here on earth. Um, and for as much as Micah's Israel had forgotten that they were God's people and covenant partners, they'd also forgotten that they were in God's image. Uh, they weren't acting like their king at all. Uh, they were financially treacherous. I mean, there was wicked scales, deceitful weights. They were violent towards people, it says in verse 12. They were lying. It was running rampant. And because they were made for something different, made in God's image, uh, God said, you're never going to experience satisfaction like that. You're going to eat but not be satisfied. There's going to be hunger in you. You'll put away. You're going to save up, but it's going to go away. You won't preserve it. What you preserve, I will give to the sword. They're going to take away all your treasure. God made sure that their crops would be barren, a lot of work for no payout. He could not let their wickedness go unabated. So as we wrap it up, I just want to say we are God's image bearers as well. We're his covenant partners. We're his special people, but we're his image bearers as well. Paul said that our citizenship is in heaven. So we have a king who is far away that we're meant to reflect here on earth. So what is our king like? I, I once heard of a, a basketball coach of a, a Christian, uh, I think it was a, uh, it was a, it was a Christian uh, school, and uh, they were playing a game, and I, I think he just kind of got caught up in the moment, and he was watching his team kind of get pushed around by the other team. And uh, he wanted to see his team be a little more aggressive, assertive. Great thing for a coach to want. And he was, like, groping for a way to communicate to all these young Christians, like, how to step it up and assert yourself. So he called a timeout, brought them all together, and uh, in his pep talk, and again, I think this was just like emotion talking. He said to them, Matt, do you guys think Jesus got punked? <laughs> you know, that was like his thing to them. Like, think about it. And uh, one, it got all quiet. Everyone's like, man, we're not being like Jesus out there, you know. And then uh, one of the kids was like, well, he died on the cross. <laughs> he was crucified. Like, yes, he did get punked is kind of the point. And the, the question is, what is our king like? What is our king like? What is King Jesus like? Who are you imitating, in other words? Who are your heroes, in other words? Omri and Ahab, like people, or Jesus? And Jesus, like people. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 5. He said, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But at this point in Micah, it seems that even though Micah is there pleading with them, and even though they bought themselves some time with some obedience, as we learn from other Bible passages, the die had been cast, and eventually they would become, as he said in verse 16, a desolation. The only way out for them was to remember their identity and begin to act like themselves, God's special people, God's covenant partners, and God's image bearers. And that's who we are. Peter said in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We, we have to remember sometimes a thousand times a day who we are and then live it out by the power of his spirit. In fact, I, I would say it like this, we have to remember a different court case not the one here in Micah 6, verse 1 through 5, but we have to remember when Christ died for us and the Father declared us who have believed in Jesus to be righteous in his sight. We have to remember that. And one way to remember that is 
via communion. So if you take out your bread and cup uh, this morning, let's open those up and prepare to take this together uh, as a church family. Communion <clears throat> gives us an opportunity to do a lot of things. But one thing it allows us to do is to ask the question, who am I? Or maybe to say it this way, who am I now? Who am I now? Not who was I, but who am I? In the sight of God, who am I? Who is the real, true me? Who is the person that when God looks at me through the lens of the blood of his only begotten son and he sees the new creature that's deep inside of me, who is that new creature that he is trying to bring out? Who am I now? And as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we need to take that in because it's through what Jesus did as symbolized in this bread and cup that it's possible for that newness to even happen and for it to be lived out in our lives day by day. So Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are and what you have done in us. We want to be who we are in you. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us of times in this last week where we behaved inconsistently with our true identity in you. And help us, Lord, to live more consistently with that identity in the week to come. Thank you, Lord. Let's eat and drink together. Lord, just as this bread and drink will become now part of us, as our body assimilates it, we pray, Lord, that the glory of the new covenant, what you have done for us and what you have remade us to be, let that, Lord, become part of us, our way of seeing ourselves. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing to our Lord.